are going to get into uh, intrinsic viscosity measurements of uh, polymers and solutions. So we are going to be dealing with um, today polymers uh, in a solvent, solvent here, and we're going to be looking at very, 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 very dilute solutions of uh, polymers in solutions. So our concentration two of our polymers um, is going to be much, much, much less than this critical concentration of overlap basically where polymer chains are going to kind of impinge and they hit each other's excluded volume. Uh, we're going to talk much, much uh, more about this kind of uh, critical concentration, this overlap concentration, uh, a little bit later in future lectures. So don't worry too much about it. But again, today we're going to be working on very, very, very dilute concentrations of polymers. So um, we have seen that viscosity and obviously molecular, molecular weight are critical parameters when it comes to um, polymer behavior and polymer properties. Um, but we could actually now um, talk about how do we actually go about measuring the intrinsic viscosity of a polymeric uh, materials. Um, and what's going to be really, really nice about these measurements is when we measure uh, the framework that we're about to develop and the equations that we're going to talk about um, and the, uh, you know, the procedure for measuring intrinsic viscosity is going to allow us to determine other polymeric properties. So solvent quality. Uh, and this kind of viscosity average molecular weight uh, as well. So you could obtain that uh, measurement uh, as well from this framework. So anyways, so before we get started, we need a little bit of uh, kind of theoretical background. So we need to introduce this uh, Einstein equation for viscosity of a solution containing basically impenetrable hard spheres of some volume fraction phi hs. So uh, that again, if you want to kind of go through that derivation, I'll be happy to provide some resources, but um, the equation is set up like this, where eta, again, is still our polymer viscosity, eta not. So we're trying to, again, calculate eta, excuse me, here, our solvent viscosity is this eta not, and our, basically, our hard spheres, our impenetrable, our impenetrable hard spheres um, is this hard sphere volume fraction, and we're going to calculate by the number of spheres, uh, divided out by the volume of the sphere, divided by the total volume, basically not on the polymer, but of our solution of polymer plus solvent. So this is kind of a critical expression uh, to kind of have and have memorized here. And you can see on the next page, uh, so, oops, excuse me, where, it, so the total number of spheres is the ratio of the concentration of polymers um, divided by the molecular weight of polymer, M scaled by Avogadro's number. So that is gonna be this total number of hard spheres. So if we go back, or the total number of spheres, excuse me. So the total number of our spheres is just the concentration of our polymer. Uh, so the, uh, divided by that molecular weight of our polymer. The ratio of the concentration of polymer divided by the molecular weight of our polymer, scaled by Avogadro. Um, this hard sphere is not equivalent to phi2. There's a different assumption, so don't worry uh, too much about that. Um, volume of the sphere is just your typical equation. Again, we're substituting in our radius of our polymer. So again, the physical picture is this, our hydrodynamic radius or our RH or our RG is going to be uh, like so. And we can now rearrange this equation, uh, the Einstein equation, to give us the specific viscosity. So previously we were measuring viscosity, or in here, let's look at for this equation for uh, the viscosity of our polymer. Now we're going to look at uh, specific viscosity. So you could see this equation here for our specific viscosity. So the physical meaning of this, you know, that's what the key thing we want to focus on. The specific viscosity is the increase in viscosity beyond that of the solvent due to the polymer additive. So if our polymer had the same, same viscosity as our solvent, what would be our specific viscosity? Zero, right? Uh, so it's the specific viscosity, if it's greater than zero, it's the increase in viscosity beyond that of the solvent due to adding our polymeric materials. So if the intrinsic viscosity, uh, the intrinsic viscosity, again, so that is the definition of specific viscosity. We can then calculate the intrinsic viscosity, uh, which is uh, here is the limit as limit of the specific viscosity uh, as our polymer concentration goes down to zero. So again, this is just this expression right here. And what's it, what it's saying here, again, is the intrinsic viscosity physically is the infinitesimal, infinitesimal increase in our solution viscosity. So this is our solution viscosity here. Uh, as we add, as you first add, just like the first polymer, or it basically it's this viscosity increase in the limit of an infinitely dilute solution. 
So again, this is a property of our polymer, not uh, a property of our solution. So this is basically saying, as we just add one polymer, what is our, uh, and that contribution, uh, it, that viscosity increase um, in the limit of this infinitely um, dilute solution. So, or again, I like this idea. Is the infinitesimal increase in solution viscosity as you add that first polymer chain. So again, property of a polymer. So this is the kind of the critical aspect here. So we know we can relate uh, Rg and we can figure out and I get an expression for our intrinsic viscosity, eta, as a function of n, see how it scales, and molecular weight here. So we can pull out this expression that we have and we've looked at previously for our um, uh, chemist chain model. Here again, we're just replacing, this should be n to one half, but we know that n scales with molecular weight. So we want to kind of put everything in terms of m because we saw previously our hard sphere, which again, this equation is equal to this over this. Our hard sphere uh, volume fraction was defined as C2 over M divided by NA times your four thirds, four thirds pi, this kind of constant to your RG squared to the three halves. So we can now, again, we want to represent the molecular weight of the chain. Um, so we can plug that back in, plug this expression in here. We will see that the C2s cancel. We'll plug in this equation 12 into here. And what you'll get is, so let's actually go ahead and do that. So I want my 2.5, again, I don't care about 2.5 times C2 divided by M divided by Avogadro's number, four thirds pi constant cubed times, again, L cubed, uh, C infinity to the three halves, excuse me. Let's move it over a little bit here. Uh, M to the three halves and alpha cubed. So what do we end up uh, obtaining in this expression here? So I want to, again, my goal is to write an expression for how the viscosity changes as a function of molecular weight. So, and then this all has to be divided again by, if you go up here, we have to divide out by C2. So C2s cancel, our M cancels here. So I'm left with M to the one half, M to the half. And you basically get, again, our scaling now, our specific viscosity scaling, is going to scale with this k, uh, basically not here, m to the one half. That's it. That's what we obtain uh, in this expression. Uh, and actually, we'll see in a second. Uh, so this is just basically lumping all of these constants. So Avogadro's number, this four pi, everything that's constant, everything that's not m gets kind of encapsulated into this k constant right here. So we can actually make it a little bit more general if we include our uh, kind of alpha parameter. Uh, that we've kind of, uh, so if we pull out alpha from this expression, let's go over here. So if we pull out alpha, then we can get this expression right here. So alpha cubed times our eta naught, so k times, uh, or our k theta, or whatever you want to kind of call it. Let's just call it k, m to the one half. And now, we can get an expression uh, and figure out, again, uh, here, this is kind of uh, rewritten in terms of this, how M scales in terms of A. So let's think about some different scenarios. So let's think about a theta solvent. So for a theta solvent, I know how does my N scale on a theta solvent, or what is my value for alpha, or how does, actually, let's go back through here. We could go all the way back to lecture three and see how does alpha um, scale for, actually we have this expression right here. So let's go back here. We can see how alpha scales as a function of molecular weight. So if I am in, let me kind of erase some of this. So if I am in my theta solvent, what is my excluded volume? This is zero. What is this? Well, this is zero as well. Uh, because your second, you know, your second body or third body interactions are that uh, basically W zero as well. So, how does alpha scale with N? 
It doesn't. It's just one. So it does not scale with n at all. So you can see we reproduce this expression. We plug in for alpha. That is just going to be our m is going to still be the one half. So for theta, our viscosity is going to scale as m to the one half. For a good solvent, so for good, we know. Actually, let's back. Let's look back here. Excuse me. So for a good solvent, we can see here alpha. So if I take this, alpha scales, this is going to be kind of hard, alpha scales as, again, n is proportional to m. So n to the 1 half, I take that one, 1 fifth, m to the 1 tenth. So m to the 1 tenth times r cubed. Let's go back here. So let's go here. So I have m to the 1 tenth, and then I'm going to cube that times m to the 1 half. So I have basically m to the 5 tenths plus 3 tenths. So that's going to be a scale to the 8 over 10. And for a bad solvent, if that makes sense, for a bad solvent like we see here, my alpha is going to scale as alpha scales as n to the minus one sixth. So uh, let's go ahead, or again, as m to the minus one sixth. Let's go back over here into our expression. So let me go back. So for bad solvent, it is going to be m to the minus one sixth cubed. So that's going to be minus a half times m to the half. So our bad solvent is going to scale just as, basically does not scale with m, m to the zero. So this kind of matches. We'll have these different values essentially for A depending on our solvent quality here. So if we have theta conditions, we're going to be uh, equals a half, poor solvent, less than a half, good solvent, greater than a half. So the intrinsic viscosity, again, depends, is related to both molecular weight and our solvent quality. So again, these are two impro important properties that we want to be able to kind of measure um, and see for different polymer solutions. What are we, you know, are we in a good solvent or are we in a bad solvent? How does our viscosity change? And again, you could kind of see, and this makes sense, if we're in a really, really good solvent right here, my viscosity increases. Again, you could be in that uh, uh, freely draining case, you know, potentially. So we're seeing kind of the similar kind of values here. So our viscosity scales as a function of molecular weight, and it also is related to our solvent quality. This is a kind of critical equation here. Um, it's called the Mark Hewink equation. Um, so we'll see how the molecular weight will scale depending, you know, their molecular weight is kind of a function of alpha as well. Like we kind of just have shown here uh, right now. So next time we're going to see how we could actually experimentally measure the intrinsic viscosity and then how we could pull out important information um, from these kind of cool uh, graphs. So, uh, yeah, I hope that uh, is clear. Let me know if you have any questions, if you want to do any more work examples. Um, and yeah, I'll see you next time when we can look at some graphs and pull out some cool material properties of polymers. All right, I'll see you all next time. Thanks. Bye.